did your youth growing up in uh, Nicaragua? What, what I part? did. I moved there when I was seven years old uh, because my mother and father were living in Nicaragua. My dad was making films uh, and taking pictures. He was a photographer and a filmmaker, and he was working with the Sandinista government. And my mother was teaching pottery, which is uh, what her main line of work was at the time. I guess she was a potter. So I was just sort of dragged along, as kids are, with their parents, right into the middle of uh, the war and the revolution and Reaganomics and how that all affected people's lives there. It was very intense. What about music? What part of what part of your life was music playing at that stage? Very little. Uh, there was no pressure on me to play music. It was just something that happened. Everyone in the family played music, and so there was no sort of, uh, you've got to play, kid, <laughs> or get out of the family. It was just, this is what we all do. So I just joined in if I felt like it, or I, I didn't. I didn't start playing guitar until I was 18. Didn't start playing banjo until I was about 25. So I had very little interest in professional music, um, even though I was playing with my grandfather from age 14 on, I guess we were started playing together when I was about 14. Did my first gig with Grandpa when we took a family trip to Japan to visit my grandmother's relatives there. And uh, as often happens in this family, we'll take a vacation and pay for it by playing some concerts. Mm-hmm. And uh, the timing happened to work out that we were in Hiroshima for the anniversary of the dropping of the atom bomb. So we played a concert in Japan, or I should say Grandpa played a concert, and he asked me if I would sing some songs in Spanish with him, which we'd never really done as a performance. We just sat around and did it. And um, I said, sure, you know. I teenagers can be so cocky you know I said, of course i'll sing with you your spanish is terrible <laughs> and um i guess uh we just had such a good time playing music together when sharing that that unspoken sort of hard to define thing that happens when two people play music yeah we had a real connection and um i learned a lot from him I still do every day. Do sure. you think, c- considering that the way you got into music was probably the best way for it to happen, rather than have that pressure right on you from a young age? Probably. I mean, there's no way to tell, really. Yeah. I'm very happy today, so I, I feel like the way things uh, went were the right way. But I think it's pretty easy to put too much pressure on a kid, and uh, so you've got to follow and. You know, the family footsteps, whatever those happen to be, you know. Yeah. Look at look at people like George Bush, and the guy doesn't really want to be president. He's a complete idiot. But he he's following in his father's footsteps because he's got nothing better to do, <laughs> partly why I think he's our president. But um, I, I think it's important to let kids discover who they are without putting the pressures of uh, public life on them. Public life is, can, be, can be so intense. I, I won't say good or bad, it's just very intense. When people see you perform and then they put their expectations on you, um, that can be a very daunting thing to someone who hasn't figured out who they are yet. And it's important for kids to, to develop their identity in a more, I don't know, in a, in a slightly pure environment, whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unsullied, maybe, by outside interference. You know, you should be this, you should be that. Be this for me. Be the, And it, people, I think, not my family, but fans of my grandpa's would often sort of try and get me to be more like him, to, sort of, to satisfy some sick 
role. You know, my grandpa means so much to them, to somebody, and they want me to fulfill that. And that's impossible because I'm not him. Mm -hmm. I'm me. And uh, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting thing, you know, the, the fame and how grandpa's fame is linked with with uh, positivity and, and, and rebellion and free speech and outspokenness and, and um, that's a very powerful thing, you know. I, I wasn't alive during it, but I'm, so the way it's been described to me is in the 60s, there were three major left-wing sort of iconic leaders in the United States. It was Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Pete Seeger, my grandpa. So that's a really, that's a very intense icon to, to grow up with, but I wasn't aware of it. It was everyone else who was aware of it, but in the family and our family, close family and friends, no one really talked about it. It wasn't a big deal. But of course, outside of that circle, you get this whole other reaction. So I think on, on kids, it's very, it's very hard yeah. and grow up with cameras and reporters constantly trying to get your opinions on things and you're six years old and say, well, my opinion is I like lollipops, you know, <laughs> my opinion on life. It doesn't really mean a whole lot, you know. They, they expect some great guy like Pete Seeger's grandson to be just as great. Well, maybe I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm not. But I, I do love playing music, and I, I think that this world's in terrible, dire straits, and people are suffering everywhere, and... Some people have too much and some people have too little. And if there's some thing that I can do to help balance the scales, I'm going to do it. And I guess that's more or less what my grandpa was trying to do. He was just trying to bring people together with music, get them to stop fighting with each other and start talking with each other. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Absolutely. So, and, so you know, we're all trying to follow in that role. You know, none of us except for the real mad people, we all want to make it work, you know. We don't want to go extinct. We'd like to have kids and carry on and pass our, our thoughts and traditions on to them. And uh, music is a great way to do that, too. I mean, it's beyond, on beyond left-wing or right-wing politics, music is just a wonderful way to share unspoken culture things that can't be expressed with words can be expressed through music um and uh, that's just you know that's it's like a, another language you know and to have learned that at an early age i think is is one of the luckiest things in my life now i believe you were um once in a punk band <laughs> <laughs> Was, yeah. was was that something you? I I love punk music. My new favorite <laughs> band is the Hives. Ah yes. Um, I think the Hives may save rock and roll if they don't destroy themselves in the process. Um, I love all styles of music, but I wasn't a punk band when I was in high school. It was called Red Cloud. We were named after one of the last Native American Indian chiefs who uh, just would not go down without a fight. And they, he kept attacking the encroaching white people who kept stealing their land. And he organized a fairly effective rebellion for a while out in the West. Can't remember exactly where he lived. But uh, they finally caught him and killed him. Uh, but we thought that was a great, a great uh, icon, you know, of. <laughs> standing up for what you believe in to the point of, of death. And so we named our band after him. We were short-lived. We lasted about a year. But it was good stuff. Terrified the daylights out of out of uh, the school where we, we played at a battle of the bands. Do you have those in Australia? Oh, yes, yeah. We played at a battle of the bands where five other bands were pretty much straight-up cover bands. And we were adamant about doing nothing but original songs. So we went out there, and we were supposed to play five or six tunes. It was a great long set for Battle of Bands. 
and um, our whole modus operandi was classic punk you know just turn everything up as loud as it could go and play hard and fast and um, my specialty was screaming <laughs> I was great at screaming in tune more or less and I, I had this American flag I remember I had an American flag on a 30 foot pole and I would wave it around over the heads of the f front row and uh, while screaming into the mic and I just remember the front row they they jumped back as I laid my first shriek upon them. It was really something. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's not much difference, except in volume, between uh, folk music and punk. I mean, at its best, acoustic folk music is very in-your-face, take you know, some of Bob Dylan's greatest songs and Woody's greatest songs and my grandpa's greatest songs. They're very in-your-face, sort of full of pathos and, and angst and pain and some, a lot of times joy, too, but it's like living on the extremes of emotion. Um, and they're expressing these things that are just raw. And that's what punk is all about. It's expressing things at their most raw and uh, trying to sort of gouge out with your nails, you know, the, the truth. That Saying that, with that punk, punk band, was there, do you think, an element of you wanting to, um, to forge your own identity there rather than be, to be seen as the, the grandson of Pete Seeger? Probably, yeah. There was a bit of that there? I imagine. No. It's hard to psychoanalyze yourself <laughs> 14 years in the past. Fair enough, 15 yeah. years in the past, but probably. Uh, there were, I just liked it, though. Yeah. I, I just love, I always loved rock and roll. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the things that my grandpa and grandma and my parents and everyone in this family of mine did so well, is they just allowed me to be who I wanted to be as I discovered music that I liked, there was never any criticism of, that's too loud, or that's too this or that, or meaningless. You know, there's a lot of meaningless art, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that that qualifies as good art, even if there is no meaning sometimes. One of my favorite bands ever was ACDC. I got into ACDC early on, and I've always loved them, and I still do. And I don't think there's a particular meaning to ACDC's music beyond let's get drunk and have sex and uh, have a good time while we do it. <laughs> but that in and of itself is a perfectly reasonable pastime <laughs> for, you know, at least for a time, for a while. It's important to be able to express that and live that if you want it. And it feels, it feels good to listen to that kind of stuff real loud and dance around with your friends yeah put just put the earplugs in <laughs> don't lose your hearing you've been involved in, in a few musical musical projects uh the mammals being one which we'll talk about shortly but also a trio with uh, sarah lee guthrie and, and johnny iron yeah and that yeah. one come together we got together i guess it was after a carnegie hall concert ironically enough I had just met Johnny. Sarah and I had known each other all our lives, but I had just met Johnny that weekend, and we were sitting up on the roof of the hotel after the show, and just all playing music together, and someone said, yeah, you guys should form a band, and we laughed. Said, you know, what would we call ourselves? The Nepotistas or something? <laughs> and um, I guess someone offered us a gig, and it's hard to say no to a, a good paying gig so we took it and uh, we never really took it that seriously uh, Sarah Lee and Johnny lived down in South Carolina and I live up at, in New York and that's a good you know 1800 miles away from each other um, but we sure had a good time playing together and we still do Sarah Lee and Johnny just put out a new record and we uh, the mammals played on it and they both played on our first record, Evolver. And when the chance 
comes along to play together at a concert or festival, we jump on it because they're our friends and they're great musicians. So, you know, those connections never go away. Um, but I, I don't really like bands that get put together specifically as a PR stunt, and that's always how Rig felt to me. It felt slightly like a PR stunt. Um, only because it was just too too much like my grandpa and Arlo or my grandpa and Woody, you know, oh, Seeger Guthrie. It's so bankrollable. Yeah. I guess there's there's something attractive about doing it the hard way and earning earning what you get. And I I felt uh, like maybe we uh, hadn't really earned that adulation. You know, we hadn't really earned our audience. Um, so. But Rig, you know, Rig just exists. It, it, we never dissolved the band. We never, we never started the band either. It just sort of was a thing that happened, and it happens again occasionally, and probably will happen till one of us dies. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's not a, it's not a career move. It's just a moment in time. Sure. So the, the mammals is is your prime focus now. Oh yeah, the mammals is. Um, Mammals could be called my career for now, I suppose. The Mammals re receives 120% of my life at this moment in time. Uh, it's, it's the proudest thing I've ever done is being in this band. It makes me very happy. Feeling Is there an, an, an initial blueprint for, for the sound of the Mammals? Did you have a, an idea up front uh, exactly what you wanted to do there? None. It was a total accident. I met Michael... Miranda, uh, while he was working at a music store in Amherst, Massachusetts, and I would come in and pester him for cheap strings, and uh, if the boss wasn't around, uh, we would sit in the front room. It was a great music store, had tons of beautiful old guitars, vintage, a lot of vintage instruments. So we'd sit up in the front room when no one was around and play tunes for each other. You know, he'd sing me his latest song, and I'd sing some old folk song and we just sort of trade back and forth that way and try and impress each other and I was just blown away by his uh, ability to write songs Con every day he seemed to have a new song and um, I had just about that time decided to try and be a, a full time musician I knew I didn't want to be a solo act um, just because I don't find that as interesting as the whole collaborative process and um, so I was throwing a party at my house, and I wanted to invite as many musicians as I could. So I invited Michael, and he said, can I bring my girlfriend? And I said, sure. His girlfriend happened to be Ruth Unger, who uh, we'd gr kind of grown up together but didn't know each other well. We'd grown up going to the same festivals, and her father and mother, great musicians in and out. In their own right, Jay Unger and Lynn Hardy and Ruth's stepmom, Molly Mason, and all fantastic musicians. And uh, there happened to be another fiddler at my party, a woman I'd met fiddling on the streets of Northampton. We busked together. We'd, you know, do a little street music. And so between Ruth and Mike and Alicia and I, we sat down in the corner and started playing old-time music. Old-time was sort of the the main thing that we could all do without too much thought and um, there was a lot of music going on at the party but somehow our little jam session attracted all the attention probably because we were being loud and obnoxious <laughs> and we drew a crowd you know the whole damn party sort of gathered around us and we just whooped it up for about three hours and drank a lot of good rum and uh, after that Ruthie, I guess, called me the next day, and we were talking, and we said, you know, next time we do that, we should charge a fee. <laughs> and so we decided we'd play one gig just to see how it went. And uh, in rehearsing for that one gig, we just had a really good time. You know, there's a connection, something hard to define. Maybe we just all sort of smelled good that day or something. <laughs> um but it's just one gig turned into two gigs, turned into three gigs. Didn't hurt that we all 
are very ambitious. Everyone in the band, I believe, is uh, way above average musician. Mikey's a great songwriter. Ruthie has an unbelievable voice and um, grew up with all that great fiddling, so she's got it in her bones. She just, all it took her was, you know, six months getting back on the fiddle. She hadn't played fiddle in about eight years when we started the band, and she just picked it right back up again. Wow. Decided, I guess I'll be a fiddler. <laughs> you know, and that, I hadn't played really serious banjo. Um, I'd only picked it up about a year before that. Mikey had only just learned it about a year before that, too. Um, it, just, it just clicked, you know. It's one of those things that when you know it's good, it's good. It's like falling in love or something. Yeah. And we just kind of fell in love with each other. Then Alicia, unfortunately, had to go her own way as uh, things happen. She lasted about eight months in the band early on, but she was key element to having uh, that band dynamic. And um, then we, when she left, we decided to form a five-piece band after for our for our second record. Uh, my phone is gonna go crazy in a second. Uh, this is terrible. Maybe it'll stay. Um, one thing led to another. You know, I think one of the things that we did right is we never put too much pressure on the band to succeed. Ruth and I just, having grown up with with successful musicians around us, we sort of knew some tricks to success and how to how to build an audience, how to do PR successfully, where the good gigs were, where the good paying gigs were. You know, it it, it does help. It's like if your parents are carpenters, you have an inst- a better chance that you'll know how to hammer a nail than if your parents weren't carpenters or you'll definitely know where to buy the good wood and cheap wood and who might need a cabinet made. So we just had sort of these tricks of the trade up our sleeves that we didn't even really know we had. And uh, when it came time to managing the band, Ruth and I proved to be exceptionally good managers and agents for the for booking and managing the, the, uh, the career of this band and, and making it something that the press really wanted to talk about, which is, you know, unfortunately, something that really has to happen. In order to get people to come see you, you have to get the press to talk about you. In order to get the press to talk about you, you have to make yourself somehow appealing. And So we just were pretty good at that. And uh, luckily, we're also damn good at the music, too. And just we always had such a good time playing together that the audience felt that sort of infectious, hysterical joy that we always experienced when we were playing together. And um, now that we've added bass and drums, you know, it's it's taken on this whole new character musically. Our, our drummer is Michael's little brother, Christopher Miranda, and he is an absolute madman. He reminds me of Keith Moon or something. Yeah. He plays... He plays drums like this is the last day on earth. He's loud and aggressive and slightly out of control all the time, and it lends this amazing air of chaos and slightly self-destructive edge to the band. And I love it. It just it feels so raw. And that's why I really I feel like we're achieving that sort of acoustic punk potential <laughs> that I always... Uh, sort of strove for and our bass player Pierce Woodward um, also grew up with Michael and Chris in Durham, New Hampshire they were in bands together when they were young teenagers so there's an old sort of musical lineage with them and we just sort of jumped on that and grabbed Pierce in pulled him into uh, what we were doing and he's also an amazing musician plays fiddle and banjo and guitar and piano and writes his own songs as does Christopher. Everyone leads such a multi-talented life that it's hard to believe that we all manage to sort of make the mammals work. <laughs> Generally with audiences, have you noticed a, a trend towards people wanting to uh, reacquaint themselves with those old-time earthy sounds? Sometimes, but more and more we're, we're uh, 
dragging younger people towards folk music. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yep. Oh, good, because my phone is buzzing. Yeah, I'm getting a little buzzy, but it's not too bad. Okay. Well, um, more and more, I think we're attracting a younger, hipper audience to what it was once called folk music. Mm -hmm. And folk music has a tendency to sort of be not very cool, which I think is absurd. It's about, one, it, since folk music pretty much encompasses all music, it should be the coolest music of all. Uh, but I understand why it's so uncool. It's because so many, folk music has become synonymous with singer-songwriters. And singer-songwriters have a tendency to be very narcissistic and annoying. And, um, but there's this whole other side of folk music, which is uh, outspoken, political, uh, very important traditional roots music, which is some of my favorite music. It's obviously folk music. And I think that's one of our unspoken missions, in a way, is to take the best elements of what we see in folk music and revitalize them, sort of make them cool again by just basically by virtue of, you know, us being, I guess, sort of a rock band playing, playing in a defined, folky way as raucous as possible. And, um, yeah, it's like, I think it's working. A lot of, we were just at the Newport Folk Festival last weekend, mm -hmm. famous in, for, in the folk circles, uh, and there's huge young audiences, massive amounts of people, teenagers and, and people in their 20s coming out to see acoustic music, which is so wonderful to be part of that. And we were lucky enough to be drawing huge crowds to our sets. So it, it really feels so good to be part of, I, well, I think it's a burgeoning movement in America right now of roots music fueled partly by movies like Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah. And uh, T-Bone Burnett, who keeps bankrolling Down From the Mountain tours and movies like Cold Mountain, which are putting roots music back in the limelight uh, for a little while and allowing this sort of music to experience a little bit of a revival in pop culture. Um, considering the dire straits of pop music, I, I think that's just fine. A great thing, absolutely. Well, playing solo at all? Very little. I just, I never enjoyed playing solo. Uh, it's, I can do it, but it always reminded me too much of being just like my grandpa. Uh -huh. And uh, like you said, you know, there's a there's a certain desire to not walk the same path and to just do something else. I I may I'll do a, I do a little bit of it. I'm going to India in October for a festival, and I'll be going there alone. But for the most part, I I get bored singing by myself. Is what it boils down to. Maybe I have a short attention span or something. But I love. I love what happens when you're playing with your friends and you don't know what they're going to do and they don't know what you're going to do. So it becomes this constant surprise and there's this mystery and it's very unpredictable and you never really know what's going to happen. And I live for that. I, I live for the surprise of it all. So um, I'll probably always try and play with other people. I've never, never really enjoyed being a solo act and uh, I, I somehow doubt I will yeah. ever really been, be able to enjoy it. Talking about your playing, does, does, your, does your banjo playing influence your, your style of guitar playing or vice versa? Absolutely. Yeah? But I can't really tell you how. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, any instrument you play influences all the other instruments you play by... Uh, just because it sort of adds to your color mm -hmm. as a musician. I think it's important to be as well-rounded as you can be so that um, 
just so that you're not coming at it all from one direction. You know, if you become multifaceted, a multifaceted gem, I suppose, is just more beautiful yeah. than a flat panel. I guess that's the the only analogy I can think of that really makes the most sense. That's a good one too. Um, it, you know, it's important to be able to play. If you want to play old time guitar, old time being old timey music in in the American definition, being sort of Appalachian fiddle and banjo tunes pre bluegrass. If you want to play rhythm guitar, I think it's good to be able to play a banjo or a fiddle so that you understand what you're trying to play rhythm for. You know, the rhythm of any style encompasses the melody, but never plays it. But it has to support it. And in order to support something, I think it's important to know exactly what you're supporting. The best way to know that is to play it on another instrument. Um, so... And one of the things that I really love to do is to play rhythm guitar for in a variety of styles, be it old time or Irish or or uh, Cajun or Scottish music. I just love playing rhythm guitar for uh, for a fiddler in particular. I, it's one of the things that really lights up my life. <laughs> and uh, so I, since I don't play fiddle, I figured. You gotta, I do play mandolin, but um, not particularly well. I just think it's important to be able to uh, play the melody on another instrument so that you know how to play rhythm for it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really know. I, I've never really thought about it. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of things before I let you go. I believe you're on the board of directors in, in the Travelling Musicians Union. Well, actually, not anymore. Not anymore? I, uh, the mammals is such a full-time job. We play about 150 to 200 shows a year. And that kind of touring schedule just didn't allow me to be on the board of the Traveling Musicians Union anymore. But I served on the board for six years, and I was very proud of uh, what we did while I was on the board. We managed to uh, push through a collective bargaining agreement with the Great Hudson River Clearwater Revival so that all musicians who play at that festival would get a uh, pension contribution to their pension plan via the union. Every, we, we set things like, uh, you know, pay scale, minimum, minimum pay scales for musicians. These are groundbreaking things. Festivals never had that, you know. Mm. Um, I'm really proud of that we, we managed to get that done. Uh, musicians are definitely, definitely professionals and should be treated as such. I firmly believe that musicians should be paid for the work that they do so that they can do it more. You know, a, a country's culture is, is expressed very well through its musicians. And if it, Canada understands it so well that they have a massive, massive fund, governmental fund, that just basically uh, funds art, be it visual or musical art. You know, they fund federally funded art in Canada. Brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. So that the culture can progress and can grow and you, the, the young people can be constantly exposed to the culture of their country. Otherwise, your culture becomes this pathetic McDonald's Disney culture, which has no life. It's not warm. It's not, it's not good for you. It's ugly and sterile and just basically fueled by greed. Whereas uh, a, a, a culture that, a country that that really sort of is proud of its culture. And if a government is smart, they'll invest money in that. And then, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no way to measure the, the effects of cultural pride in, on, a, on a nation. But I notice it when we go to other countries where they're much more proud of their musical heritage than we are here sometimes in America. And I think that's, Part of the reason is because uh, 
they culturally value it financially. They value it financially. They treat their musicians like professionals, mm. and um, that way they can get better, better and better. You know, if you pay them, they can afford to quit their day job. So I think it's important. Uh, I've, I've strived all my life to, you know, make musicians paid better and better every time. Uh, within reason, you know, no one needs to be a millionaire either. I, I don't think that we need to be all living the good life like Britney Spears. <laughs> um, but it would be nice to be able to buy a house and, you know, have kids and and not have to to worry every day about where you're going to, you know, make enough money to put food on the table. And uh, a lot of musicians do worry about that. And they just do it for the love of it, which also is a great fueler of good art. So obviously there's some, uh, some good comes from the suffering. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, I, I think it's very important to have musicians be paid decently yeah. and uh, treated decently. So that's, that was my main reason for uh, serving on the board of directors there. But uh, it's good, good stuff. I think the Traveling Musicians Union is an amazing organization. Is your radio show still happening over there, is it? You know, that's another thing that, uh, that sort of uh, the mammal's career took precedence over my radio show. I uh -huh. enjoyed it, though. Two and a half years, we did a monthly live radio show. Um, and we had a blast. We'd have three musical guests, and uh, did a lot of political commentary and in a very exciting time in American history. So it was a good run, but I knew it was, it was destined to be, you know, short-lived run because yeah. we were way too in your face <laughs> for, for them to let us uh, do that for too long. We just were, we were saying all sorts of things like the wall in, in Israel was a terrible idea. Man, we got a lot of hate mail for that one. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, I, I was actually, we were on the air the night we went to war in Iraq. Oh, dear. And that was really intense. Yeah. Because halfway through the middle of, halfway through the show, I got a call from, uh, from, I guess, the, like, the station manager saying, I'm, we're going to have to cut into your show because we just went to war. So here we are singing happy little songs, and all of a sudden, boom, on comes the news. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gone, you know, bombs have started falling in Iraq. President Bush has declared war. And, and then we're back to the Tao of Tao, and I couldn't just keep playing music. You know, we had to talk about it. You can't just let that go by. You can't behave like it's not happening. Yeah. You have to react to life as it happens to you. Otherwise, you're not being a mirror, which is what artists are supposed to be. Artists are supposed to be the antenna <clears throat> of, of the world. And um, so we got in too much trouble for basically doing exactly what we were supposed to be doing. We just got in trouble for being the antenna. <laughs> <laughs> Now, look, I've got to let you go. I know I've kept you longer than I, than I said I would. Uh, what, what's coming up?